Howdy, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Talkin' Shoot. Today on the show, we have none other than the greatest bull rider of all time, Mr. Dale Brisby. We recorded this episode right before the 22 NFR, and as always, Dale delivered the gold. It's a great conversation, and I can't wait for you to hear it. This episode of Talk and Shoot is brought to you by Rock and Roll Denim's Range Collection. It's our brand new, super comfortable loungewear line made to keep you feeling stylish and comfortable all at the same time. Whether you're lounging around at the house or you're out and about in town, either which way, find a style today at rockandrolldenim.com that's just perfect for you. And now, without any further ado, this is Talk and Shoot. All right, so we're here. How's it going, Mr. Dale Brisby? Uh, it's good. It's good to pass through uh, Panhandle and rock and roll denim warehouse every now and then get some new pants oh yeah pearl snaps oh yeah and then we're on to the next one yeah man i we always love seeing you in here it's always really nice for the people that work here especially some of the newer people that come through and they'll just be walking through the halls and be like that's dale brisby <laughs> happens yeah. quite a bit well it wasn't that way all the time yeah. So <laughs> I was, I've been an endorsee for uh, rock and roll for like seven years. And the very first deal that I went to was uh, um, Dallas Market, or it wasn't Dallas Market, it was in Denver. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Wisa. Yes, sir. And uh, they called security on me. No way. Really? <laughs> for real, for real. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm getting paid to be here, right, actually. Right. And uh, yeah, Jameson came out from the back and he, he had been in a meeting like no 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 this guy's supposed to be here believe it or not that's crazy man but uh anyway my yeah. very first year working for the company was the last year that we did Wisa in denver and yeah. I, I really like the new showroom in dallas i think it looks a lot it looks really nice and we put a lot of work into it but i do kind of miss going out to colorado at this time <laughs> that's how i'm here i don't know i don't i'm sure there's times of the year where it's Denver is pretty. Mm -hmm. January is not one of them. <laughs> no. Well, I think really it's just more convenience. We do the uh, Steamboat Music Fest and uh, yes, Steamboat, yeah, right? And so it's usually just like a three-hour drive from there. So we'll hit that, and then we'll head to Wisa, and then we'll come home. Yeah, that was pretty convenient, yeah. actually. Yeah. Because um, now we got to book it back to Dallas. Yeah. But I'm usually ready to get back to Texas anytime. Like as soon as I leave Texas, I'm ready to get back to Texas. I've got like a three day mark. By that third day, that's when I'm like, yeah, it's, it's about time to go home. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we were actually, me and my buddy, we took a vacation last week and we were in Denver and it was almost as hot as it is here. Really? Yeah. It was about 94, 95 every single day. Why vacation to Denver? Well, we, so we're music guys. We've always been in band since we were in high school and middle school and everything like that. And so any opportunity that we get to go check out one of our favorite artists play at Red Rocks, we always like to go out there because that's, in my opinion, the best venue I've ever seen in this country. It's amazing. Yeah. Have you ever been out there? No. I just don't want to sound too like anti-Denver. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to pick my words. Like, well, what's great about Red Rocks is it's kind of on the outskirts and it's in a mountain. So the entire thing is a naturally carved amphitheater out of a mountain. Yeah. And then it just sits at the bottom and then you can see Denver and Colorado Springs and yeah. all the cities like in the background of it. It's really. I bet they sound pretty good on the radio, though. I'll oh, yeah. Check them out there. Yeah. I'll send you the link. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, you know, we're, we're coming up to the end of the uh, 22 rodeo season, 2022 rodeo season, and it's been a pretty crazy season so far. How did you think, how did you think things kind of shaped up this year? How did you feel about it? Rodeo wise? Yes, sir. Um, well, you know, I really planned on cracking out at some point midsummer when I normally do, but <laughs> Spirit Airlines still hasn't sent me my rigging bag. So I'm just, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of kick my, you know, return back to the 2023 season. So as you know, I know a lot of people are out there wondering when I'm going to crack out, which there's still time, even though there's two weeks left in the season, there's still time if I wanted to make the NFR. Oh, I could. for sure. So I'm looking right at the camera because I want to be on record. <laughs> um, but as far as everybody else who would be competing for second if I were entered, I think that bull riding – uh, looks like Stetson is having a stellar year. Of course. Isn't it? I think he's got like over 300,000 one. He does. It's like two weeks left. He's got 300,000 the one. Then uh, uh, Bronk riding, he's sitting second right behind Sage Newman, who's having a record year. Yes. Both those guys just need to have an okay NFR to win the world in their respective events. And I think... Stetson's probably got the um, the uh, 
all around sewn up. And then the bareback is uh, looks like Jess Pope. Yes, sir. Is who's uh, rock and roll denim in Dorsey. Yes, sir. Is holding strong. Tim Connell's number four. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's so far it's going to be a really good NFR. There's some new guys coming in, some like NFR rookies that'll be competing. And um, yeah, I think we've got nine days left on the season. They just better hope I don't decide to enter a couple. Enter up. <laughs> but um, other than that, I didn't. I haven't really paid attention to timed events since, uh, well, really ever. Yeah, I can so, understand. <laughs> <laughs> Ruffies be kinda, ruffian. Yeah, my uh, arena is 90 foot long, and there's no rope and box in it. So Understood. I got a lot of respect for timies, you know, just because we need it to be a two-hour performance. Mm -hmm. So we need to fill that extra time with something. But... Um, Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think so, we got really lucky. We were supposed this year. to have a pretty good timey with us on this podcast today, old Tough Cooper. Old Tough Cooper, he was supposed to be here. Yeah, but uh, hopefully we can get him on the next one. I know he's probably kind of relaxing just a little bit, getting his mind straight. He's yep. he's really into like taking care of his mental health as much as he is his physical and his horses, of course. But uh, I think I think that really propels him. I think he's sitting third right now. Yeah, I believe so. And then Shad on top. We've got a lot of endorsees this year that are doing really, really well. Chad's doing good again, mm -hmm. but that's no surprise. Of course. So. And then in the barrels, I believe right now as it sits, we have five ladies. Dang. Going far. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, we've got, I mean, Jordan Briggs just, she's on fire. She has been for the last two years, and her time's great. Got great horses, running them well, and it seems like she's entering the right rodeos at the right time, so. We're really proud to have her on the squad as well as Cheyenne and Stevie and, you know, just the regulars that you would expect to make the NFR every year. But I am excited for our new crop and our rookies that are coming up to actually get out to Vegas and see the Thomas and Mac for the first time and, you know, do the grand entry and just experience everything that the NFR in Vegas has to offer for them. Where are y'all staying? Uh, this year we're at the Virgin again, we're doing the Virgin. Yeah, we, we were there last year. Uh, last year was kind of our first like a little experiment with it to see how it was going to go. But, you know, I think what really came from that was more so a learning experience of what activations and things that we could do in the future to make it even better. Because realistically, we're the only brand there. And it's yeah. so close to the Thomas and Mac that I think it provides us a benefit as a company and the people that we invite as far as our guests and customers that want to come out and experience the NFR too, they can stay there. And if they wanted to, they could walk to the Thomas and Mac. It's right Dang. there. Yeah, it's good times. So it, was, it was a very strategic location that we chose for that and we had a really good time that last year and we're excited for this year too we're going the airbnb route really got a big house nice. put the whole crew in there nice i am absolutely stoked you kind of run it like a content creator house for the couple yeah. weeks you're out there yeah i guess yeah i guess so you so. staying out there 15 days oh yeah. yeah yeah we'll be there the whole time but um yeah we um um i think the rock and roll denim after party will probably is the only one I'm really bound to, I guess you could say. Oh yeah. That's the only one I'm going to really commit to. Oh, we're and, working hard on that to make it cool for you, man. It's going to yeah. be fun. So that'll be, that'll be pretty much the only after party I go to. But other than that, I'll be at my booth every day and then I'll be at a rock and roll denim booth probably three times. But, um, Vegas for me this year will probably be the most laid back that it has been just so mainly so I can focus on those booths. Yes, sir be there longer but um do you have like a lot more product this year than you have in the past or are you keeping about the same booth size out in vegas this year the booths are bigger bigger yeah cool. mandalay's 10 by 20 and then convention center cowboy christmas will be a 20 by 30. how do you rotate your time between the different places that you have to go to like booths are set up kind of all over town um i'm gonna try to make it a consistent time at every one but convention center will be priority just because it's sure there's so many more people there so i'll go to mandalay like i may start and finish my day at mandalay but that the middle of the day the heat of the day will be convention center yes, so sir. i'm thinking about like maybe setting like a a specific time every day that i'm at the convention center like noon or something sure so get like a late breakfast early lunch show up at the convention center at noon Gotcha. kind of deal so that's just an idea i've got right now but um anyhow yeah, yeah that's well it's definitely one of those things you have to keep in mind because once you get out there it is non-stop go 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 
yeah. until you leave. Ten days in a row. Yes, sir. So then guys entered. I don't know how they manage the – I mean, they just do because they have to, but the also the uh, the autograph signings every day. Every day. Especially like them guys that have – four and five sponsors, you know, because they're not going to do a signing every day, but if they do three per sponsor and they got four, I mm-hmm. mean, if my math is correct, that's 11 <laughs> sponsor uh, signings. It adds up pretty quick. We, uh, but Shad, I think Shad last year, he's, I believe he's Bloomer and he's us. And then Bloomer was right next to the rock and roll booth. So there was one day where he went straight from Bloomer where he was there for like two hours straight to us for another hour. Yeah. And that led him right up to about three o'clock where he had to start getting ready for the perf that night. Exactly. That's crazy. The grind on them, like yeah, the timed event's a whole nother deal. Yes, sir. They got to get ready, but they they also got to get their horse ready. Yes, sir. We don't have to get our horses ready. You know, yeah. Stock contractor does that for us. That's right. That's a nice little benefit. But just got to make sure Spirit didn't lose your rigging bag. Yeah. Gosh darn it. Can you imagine the business that they could probably form off just having a bunch of cowboys rigging bags and selling off a bunch Sell of gear? used rodeo gear? Yeah. yeah. I've done it. I've done it. <laughs> Rodeogoods.com. That was that was my first venture before DaleBrisby.com. Is it still active? I don't know. Maybe on the black internet, black market. But I sold used rodeo gear, so I would I would buy Blue Mitchell, the oh, PBR yeah. bull rider. I sold him his first bull rope off of Rodeogoods.com. That's crazy. And it was Blue. That's how he got his nickname. <laughs> he actually he actually uh, he didn't crash it because he's more than welcome. But he showed up to our party last year in Vegas. Yeah. And we were very surprised to see him. We were like, yeah, let him in. Come on. Right. <laughs> For sure. Well, another thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, I've been adjacent to this injury in industry, excuse me, now for about three years and doing this whole thing with content creation and podcasting and shooting videos and shooting commercials to this day, there's still nobody that does it like you do. So I wanted to ask you what really made you decide to step into the world of being, you know, in in front of the camera and speaking on this really cool sport and this really cool lifestyle that we get to live every day? Well, um, so, but before we were even turning on a camera, I was always anxious to do interviews at like rodeos or to help promote the industry, to help promote the sport. So, cause when you start going to rodeos, you'll notice they'll either be a newspaper or some, especially now with everybody trying to create content, there's always somebody wanting to do a story or do a, and it wasn't that I thought my story was that important, but it was, I wanted to be an ambassador for the sport. And, um, and so being an ambassador for my faith and then the sport has always been a priority to me. And so when I saw opportunities to do that, I would gravitate towards them and that so that became natural so i was also a class clown and so i loved making people laugh so you know 2013 is when we made our first video we read uh me weston rutkowski and mitch montgomery were in cowtown there's a, a rodeo up in new jersey that happens every weekend in the summer and Weston and I were actually fighting bulls there and we were hanging out in Betsy's bunkhouse the stock contractor that puts it on and we made the first video Mitch did and I already had I'd already had a Facebook for three years but we hadn't really ever made a a video Um, little snippets here and there but nothing serious so anyways he put that first video out on YouTube, and I think the release date was July 1st, 2013, still on the internet, still on YouTube. And that's that's where it started. And so the timing was um, nothing short of divine intervention because, you know, 2013, that was even before social media was popular with our industry. Right. Like it was barely starting to get popular really with um, – mainstream but western industry wasn't there yet there were a lot of people that were still like well i'll never have a facebook you know they would those same people had earlier said they would never have an email or a cell phone then they got an email on a cell phone they said they would ne- ne- never have a um, a facebook then they got a facebook yeah but i'll never have instagram yeah but then i'll never have snapchat now it's TikTok. yeah <laughs> and then they eventually get it so anyhow a lot of our industry was like i'll never do social media but 
anyhow, there were a lot of kids that were doing it. So we made that first video and it didn't go viral, but it made the rounds in the Western industry and, um, everybody could relate to the, the jokes that we were making. And so then we made another video and then we made another video and then we made another video and pretty soon we were making them a couple of months and then a couple of week and then every day. And we had the branding and the marketing long before we had the product. So, cause we, we had no plans. We were just, I enjoyed making people laugh. Mm -hmm. Rodeo and ranching were what I was passionate about and passionate about. And so making people laugh in those industries was like my default. And unbeknownst to us, all these videos were branding a product that we didn't have yet. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what helped us get started was the branding and the marketing came long before the product. Cause a lot of people will come to the internet now and they have a product or they have a desire to make money, which is okay, but people don't care. Right. And, and so when you come to the internet and you put this product out there with no incentive for people to buy it, they're not going to buy it. Um, you know, if you're into sports and you walk into a foot locker, you're going to gravitate towards, you know, Nike. Right. And it's either going to be because of Michael Jordan or LeBron James. And you don't think about that. You just gravitate towards it. But because you enjoy watching those guys, you do. It's, it's like subconscious that you gravitate towards this shoe. Nike didn't spam you with an email. Correct. They didn't spam you with an ad. They may have them occasionally, but that's not why you're going over there. You're going over there because you're a Michael Jordan fan. Right. And so um, that was kind of us in the beginning and still is today. Um, I realized that, you know, these videos that, um, had power to them, but they had to be authentic. Right. And because we did authentically, genuinely enjoy making people laugh and want to make entertaining content, it, it worked. Mm -hmm. And, um, so then, you know, full disclosure, I discovered Gary V. Sure. Who, uh, really affirmed a lot of the things we were doing. Right. And he put, he kind of put the textbook to a lot of the things that I was thinking in the back of my, my head. I just didn't have words for it. And he gave me kind of permission to keep going down this lane that I was headed, Right. which was, you know, long, long term. And a lot of his so, videos, he kind of yells at you to make sure that you do so. Yeah. You got to get, once you get past the yelling right. and the, and the cuss words, then, you know, which for our industry, you kind of have, to, you know, a lot of people won't get past that. Sure. But once you do, it's a pretty impactful message as far as like what we're, what it takes to be successful on social media. And I think looking back, some people may disagree with this as far as like the branding, the, the sales that I've done. So there's a, there's a balance between marketing and branding and sales. And um, looking back, I think I've left way more money on the table than not because of how much I haven't like been a salesman. And some people may see, they may watch my stuff and know and enough and think that Manny sells all the time, but really I don't, I don't think I do. I do way more videos that never talk about my website than I do videos that do talk about my website. Right. Like if you go through, if you scrub through my YouTube, my TikTok, my Instagram, my Facebook, and you count the last 100 pieces of content I put out, I would be really surprised if you came up with five that said the words dalebrisby.com. I can really only think of one time all year when you do it, and that's Black Friday. Yep, Black Friday, and then I'll do a spring sale. So mm -hmm. that those time, those two times of year, it's a it's not a sale, it's a giveaway. But those two times a year, if you follow me during that time, you're you might think I'm focused on sales. But if you're following me all year long, you're gonna find like five percent of my. I'm gonna say like three or four percent of my posts are gonna be some sort of sale. Um, so anyhow, I say all that just to give you my theory on how it should be done. Sure. 
and essentially what I'm trying to do is provide the the audience with value. You know, the, whether it's a 14 year old steer rider from Nebraska or a barrel racer in New Mexico, or just somebody that appreciates the sport, you know, a CPA in Fort Worth who had an uncle that rodeoed. Like I want those people to watch our content and get value, 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 value. And then one day I might ask them if they want to buy a shirt. Right. But, um, because we do have to keep the lights on, you know, I got three guys in here sure. and they're all on payroll. Hey y'all. Like they're getting paid right now. Yes, sir. And something's got to pay those bills. And so eventually I do have to sell something. So, um, I think that as far as like standing out in our industry though, um, I think our passion for what we're doing and the stuff we're making content around is what has allowed us to sustain a level of growth. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to say we're bigger than anybody or whatever. I don't know. I don't care. I'm not comparing myself. I'm not competing with those people. I mean, I am in a way, but not really in sure. my mind. Like I want to be the best version of me that I can be. Um, and I think, but I think that we are doing well in our own minds because if the cameras die and all the batteries die, like we're going to still do what we're doing. Right. And like, there's a lot of times like we'll look up and like, dang, we should have filmed that. <laughs> or man, we should have got some cameras set up. Like we're going to do the thing no matter what we turn on the cameras and it'll be entertaining for everybody. But I mean, to me that, that screams authenticity you know, better than anything. Like we're not here to make money. We need to make money so we can be here, Sure. but we're here because we're passionate about it. And I think that's, that's a prerequisite. Mm. And again, morally, there's nothing wrong with, I don't think, cause I, I believe in capitalism. There's nothing wrong with somebody that wants to come to this space just to make money. That's fine. But the, but the average consumer is pretty dang smart. They're going to see through that. Yeah. So social media is a time waster. Right. But when you're, when you are doing your scrolling, you do not want somebody to waste your time. Right. And that's one of the things as a content creator for a brand, I have to always keep in my mind. Like I want to make sure, just like you said, I want to make sure I'm providing as much value to our audience as I can without specifically asking them to buy something. Mm -hmm. However, my entire business, our entire business, is focused on selling products, selling jeans, selling. Right. But in my mind, I've kind of had this mantra that I'm not there to sell. And I'm specifically not there to sell jeans. I'm there to sell the culture. I'm there to sell the lifestyle. And hopefully they see people like you and they'll see people like a tough or a shad or a tough Hedeman. And they'll relate to that and be like, well, if it's good enough for world champions and Maybe I'll give these jeans a shot and see what the reflex does for me. Yes, sir. So that and and so that's two parts of marketing that this industry the last thing you said is is the only marketing some of the only marketing that this industry has known for a long time, any industry really, and that's put your product on a notable figure in the arena. Mm -hmm. So Tough Cooper's wearing it. Um, Jess Pope, Tuff Hedeman, Jacobs Crawley, like if those guys are wearing it, then it means something to the consumer because just like the Michael Jordan and LeBron James thing I said earlier, like these guys are that of our industry. And um, I mean, I was wearing rock and roll denim before I was an endorsee because Jacobs and I were such good buddies mm -hmm. and he introduced me to the product and I loved it. So I'm, that's exactly how I came about it. Um, but what social media has done is added a little more, just the internet in general has added a direct to consumer version of that marketing. And it's way more uh, quantifiable. Sure. So how do you quantify Jacobs or Tough Hedeman wearing this product? Well, it's hard to like, how many butts are in the seat at the Thompson Mac? 18,500. But how many of them saw it? We don't know. How many of them liked it? We don't know. How many of them have a comment to make about it? How many of them would share it with their friends? You don't know. Well, if you do a Dale Brisby video with rock and roll denim tagged, you know all those things. How many people watched it? How many of them liked it? How many of them had a comment about it? And then how many of them shared it with their friends? And so it's easier to quantify and it, it, and it satisfies that 
the people that are pouring dollars into the budget for marketing, um, you know, it kind of helps scratch the back of a guy like you. Correct. Because you can go, you can take this data. People love data. Oh, yeah. Especially people around here that are very into data. Unfortunately, for marketers, the data that's most important, which it's unfortunate and it's fortunate, but the, the, the most important data is the sales. Correct. And so that's where you and I get to like, we love sales because that's what pays the bills, but we hate sales because as marketers, that means we got to switch from entertaining someone to asking them for something. Right. Even in everyday life, that's a tough... That's awkward. Like if I need to ask somebody for something, like when you need something from someone, like that's an inconvenience to them. And so same thing on social media. Right. And I... Social media is, it's one of those things that like, you'll get those numbers, you'll get metrics, you can follow trends, you can try to keep up with what the algorithm's doing, but to quote my good friend Brian Broaddus from the Dallas Cowboys, social media is a strange lady, and it will change on you very, very quickly, and you have to be able to keep learning, keep following what's happening, keep following what's going on, stay timely, and just try to make sure that you're still on top of the game at the very end, and it is a tough thing to do sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's um, – so I've just tried to, for the nine years we've been making videos, from nine years and three months, I guess, July 1st, 2013, till now, um, I just try to dance with the one that brought me. Oh, yeah. And so create content, distribute content, engage with my community. Yeah. Like I personally try to do those three things every day. Um. I will pack orders and I will, you know, weed eat around the warehouse. I'm not afraid to, I've done those things, but I, I have people in the warehouse that help with those things to make sure that I do keep doing the thing that got us here, which mm -hmm. is create, distribute, engage. I think another thing that you do that I've always found really impressive is that you surround yourself with people, you know, some of the interns that you bring in, some of the guys that become full-time staff members. You seem to surround yourself with very talented and smart people too. And does that help? I'm sure it does. But tell me how that helps you out. Well, it's absolutely. I mean, the culture that we've created at Rodeo Time is the heartbeat of Rodeo Time. And it's something that I'm, I'm trying to cultivate and also protect so we're very careful and strategic about who we bring in and who who comes into the to, into the team and who stays on the team, because um, but it's a, it's a give and take. It's an interesting situation that we've all been blessed with because um, number one, there's been friendships formed, you know, that I think will last longer than rodeo time. There's but there's uh, some give and take, you know, it is a job where all the interns are paid now. There's not anybody here working. Usually they just work for free the first few weeks, but, um, they're all on salary now. So they've got a job number one, but then there's, there's also the benefit of being able to learn how to ranch, learn how to rodeo. Um, so it's a pretty sweet deal. The only catch is it's all videoed. Right. And so sometimes there are moments where like these three interns that are brand new, um, we've been actually going out gathering pastures. Um, I've got this one pasture where they learn how to gather and then we've drug calves like four times, maybe five times in the last five weeks. Um, and there's been various things we needed to do with those cows. Like we picked up a bull once. There was a cow had a cut leg. There's, you know, there's some strategic things that we need to do as ranchers. But to gather a pasture and drag those calves five times, like that's excessive for a ranch. You usually just do that once a year, and then the second time you gather them, you're weaning. Mm -hmm. But we do it multiple times so that these guys can learn. Sure. And it's it's the romantic part of cowboying that a lot of people want to know how to do. That's my favorite part of this whole culture. Exactly. Yes, sir. You know, gathering cows, um, sorting cows off the calves, and then, you know, dragging the, you know, roping. It, it's all the things. Flanking. Um, but they got to be able, they got to be willing to be a little bit vulnerable because they're now learning on camera. 
And right. so you kind of got to, it's, it's tough just because, yeah, ideally they get to learn when nobody's watching and they're not vulnerable. But on the other hand, like if nobody was watching, they wouldn't have a job. Right. So <laughs> um, it's kind of a catch-22. But it's a good situation because those guys get to – and then, for instance, yesterday, one of them got to get on their first bull. Wow. And uh, it's a big moment. So we're going to film it. Right. <laughs> you know, and it – you he may not do well, but that's just a chance he's got to take. But – um. But that's just kind of what makes the wheels go round, so people kind of understand that before they get here. But literally, if I hadn't been filming, none of them wouldn't even know I existed. So, mm-hmm. um, so that has helped with the culture. We've got a bunch of people that they're there for a bigger purpose. You know what I mean? Like we're people aren't just checking boxes. We we do have some locals that that work for us, and it is just you know. I don't want to say just a job, but, you know, they need a job and we're able to fill that need. But most of our warehouse is people that are there to, they need a job, but then they've also got a dream, a goal of doing this other thing. Mm -hmm. And it may be as simple as like learning how to ride a horse, right? but it's still something they're striving towards. And when you get around somebody that's got a goal and a vision, it's, it's contagious, Mm -hmm. you know, no matter what it is, it might be to lose 10 pounds. But once once you can you can like sense that drive in someone, and when someone is striving towards something, it's uh, it's contagious and it's you just it, it's hard not to attach yourself to that journey they're going on. Right. Not to sound too much like a elementary school poster on the wall, <laughs> but but it's a real thing. You know, if we were all just there and five o'clock stops and the editors slam their laptop shut and warehouse deal just shuts off. Like I think that that would probably be translated into the videos and you would, you could, you could probably sense that. Yeah. But that's, that's not the case. Right. Um, I think with us too, I mean, being an editor and being in that creative spot where you're trying to put something together that does mean something for your audience. Like I don't even know what time it is. There's, I call it being plugged in. You're passionate. Exactly. There'd be times I'll be starting at two o'clock. Next time I look up at six thirty, and you know the warehouse manager is trying to kick me out of here. Exactly. And there, it doesn't matter what you're doing. I spent a summer with Craig Cameron, and I was like 13 years old, and I heard him say this, and it stuck with me, because as a young cowboy who was passionate about riding horses, training horses, Craig has one of the dream jobs in our industry, which. I don't want to be a lifetime horse trainer, but like I can relate to those who do. Well, Craig puts on these clinics. He's got a cool ranch. He teaches people how to ride. And he said, um, I'll never forget. He said, it doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, you were put on this earth to be an astronaut when you're, you might be in space and there'll be days where you wished you were doing something else. Sure. And so I think no matter I, that, I believe that if you're a, career rodeo cowboy if you're you know a youtuber if you're an astronaut if you're a horse trainer like there's just going to be days where you look to man like what if i'd have gone this other path Mm -hmm. and um the main thing i believe is that so long as those days don't stack up on top of each other and you have more of those days than not in a month or a year Mm -hmm. then then you're probably on the right path but once you start having seven, eight, nine, 73 days of that in a row, then yeah. you might need to get on LinkedIn or something, so find you another job. I keep this little notebook uh, by my desk every day that just has a list of everything that I want to do. And it's mostly just in case somebody asks, hey, what did you do yesterday? I can show you what I actually did. But I've gotten to this habit of right by the date, I'll put a W. I think they call those diaries. Close, yeah. Okay. You can read mine if you want to. It's cool. I don't. I understand. That's a dangerous road. (laughs) But by the date, I'll put a W or an L at the end of the day. And if I got more stuff off my list, then I, you know, if there's more stuff done than there is stuff that I didn't finish, that's a W. And I'll always try to prioritize what stuff's going to be important, what stuff's timely, what stuff needs to come out now. But if I can get the majority of that list done, that's a W. And my whole goal is to get five W's a week. Every single week. That's like a, that's a cool way that to like, quantify and use that data in your day yeah 
That's interesting. I like I like tangibility. I like seeing it. Yeah. I like seeing what's coming up and no cuz here I'm mean, sure you know you too like next week is going to be something and then the next week there's going to be something and it can get really easy to get bogged down by jobs or projects that you've gone out and shot and that you need to get done and get edited but oh now I got to go on another shoot and get this done so things kind of stack up in the bank a little bit. It you have to have something to keep your mind wrapped around what you already got and what you're going to go do. Yeah, so that's that's like a to me that's a daily ongoing battle. Absolutely. I've had people work for me that wanted more structure. And I get that. Like they want a plan. We're going to film Monday, Tuesday, then we're going to edit Wednesday, Thursday, and then we're going to do this other thing Friday. And that's the schedule all year. Mm-hmm. But like as a it just life just doesn't work that way right. when you're moving this fast. Right. If you are an accountant your life works that way, mm-hmm. but I'm not an accountant. So this week, for instance, um, you know, Wednesday morning, all right, we're gonna we're gonna go do this podcast here, and then we're going down to Huntsville. Um, looks like it's gonna be a quick trip. We're gonna turn around Thursday. We got to stop in Stephenville and pick up this horse. So we should be back in the office Friday. But this other thing might be ready where we go make a video Friday and Tyler. And so there's this this ongoing flow of like. You just do the best you can. Yeah. So we we practiced yesterday. Um, we did some ranching Monday. And so next week, the week's going to look completely different, but it'll be a version of that. And so I've just found, at first I thought it was specific to YouTubers, but I just, I think that you've got to be fluid. Because I like, I like itineraries for the most part. I don't like writing them out, but I like whenever you do know that something's going to happen at a certain time, but you got to be willing to throw it out the window if something else better comes up. Yep. Always That's, adapt. But I thought it was specific to YouTubers. I don't think it is. I think it's ever everybody in life, you know, like the anxiety of that itinerary changing just kills you. So if you can go ahead and plan ahead and know that it's probably going to change. That's me. Right. I do like lists and I'll make them in my phone, but... I'm starting to see why people have assistants. Yeah. Yeah. I'm lucky enough that as of Ninafar last year, I got somebody to come help me out with social media. Huh. When I first was hired, as you know, I was everything. I was content, still photography, videography, social media, website, e-commerce, stuff like that. Like making sure that our retailers get the media that they need. And there came to a point where like, one of these things is going to fail. Like I'm right. juggling all these glass balls in the air. One of these days, one of them is going to fall and break. And I don't want that to happen at the detriment of the company. Right. And so having somebody that can just kind of monitor what's going on on social media, what's working, what's not, and just having fresh ideas and just somebody that can see things that maybe that I can't really, really helped out so much. Right. And so I was really fortunate to have that help that I have now. And Well, you've stayed. So since I've been here, like your position and the ones around you, like it's, it's almost been a revolving door, you know, like it's a tough position to fill. Yeah. And people that are super talented at it. Like I know one or two before you that like were really good at it. And then they went and did their own thing. Right. You know? And so it's gotta be, it's a, it's a tough p- and in defense of rock and roll, the position is kind of evolving. I hate mm. to use that word, but you know, with social media growing and e-commerce growing. When I first got here, they didn't even sell rock and roll denim online. Well, now the website has come, come about rock and roll denim.com plug (laughs) and they need social media more. Mm -hmm. So now all of a sudden you do need an assistant. Well, seven years ago, we barely needed this job here, right? Much less an assistant for it. So, um, there's a lot changing in the industry. So I think Rock and Roll Denim, like many other companies, are are trying to adapt. But that's the beauty of where I'm at. Like I'm in marketing, I'm in sales, I'm at the top. Like I'm at that sweet spot, I believe, of a company size where I can organize a company meeting in half the size of this room in about three minutes (laughs) where Rock and Roll Denim has a little more hoops to jump through yeah we got to send out that teams invite about a week before the meeting actually right. starts yeah or keep those meeting going at october the same time. <laughs> we'll have a meeting yeah. Yeah, next month maybe 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. yesterday we were out at a photo shoot in Dallas all day long, and that's generally our marketing meeting days. And so I'm sure we'll push that to today. We always have stuff to talk about, but got to be fluid. Got to be, be fluid. Got to be ready to adjust. Yes. And Carly Peterson asked me one time, like, what do you think? She's was from the Cowboy Channel back, I think, from the last couple of NFRs. But she asked I remember me one time. Carly. Oh yeah, she's great. She asked me. She's like, what is really the secret? And I was like, I can't tell you. I have no idea. But what I do for me is I try to learn one thing about one new thing about either media or social media every single day. If you can pick up on something that's changed, if you can pick up on what other people are talking about, what they're doing, you just always have to stay knowing. You have to yeah. stay ready and stay understanding what's going on. I was at Mesquite like 12 years ago and I was getting ready and they were, Trevor was there. It was towards the end of the season and what's her name? I'll remember her name. She was interviewing him and, uh, um, she said, what's the secret to success? And, and he real quick said, there is no secret to success. It's just hard work. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same thing with social media. Um, you got to tell a story and for them to be interested, you have to be interesting. So you make interesting content often. Quality is important, but I think quantity is sometimes more important. Mm -hmm. So that means it's hard work. And so if somebody's willing to work hard, once they figure out the formula, then they can do it. Um, but it's, it's just rinse and repeat. Like Tiger Woods said, same boring strokes every single day. Mm -hmm. That's how you do it. You do the same boring stuff every day. And yes, it does require passion, but the, I guess the boring part is just the, the, the day in and the day out, you know? So anyhow, that's my two cents and that's probably all it's worth, but <laughs> oh, no. I'm sure to, I'm, I know for a fact to a lot of people, it's worth a lot more than that. Well, we I'm definitely sure. appreciate your knowledge around here for sure. Especially me. And you've always been there to help me out in anything I needed. And well, know. I always like to point out rock and roll denim. They were the OGs. Like when it, that first NFR, Jameson called me and, uh, yeah, I was broke, a, broke as a joke and it wasn't even funny. <laughs> I didn't tell Jameson that, but yeah, that our first deal we did together, I walked out of there. I said, jokes on you. I'd have taken less, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Love that. no, it's been a good, it's been a good relationship with rock and roll denim and, um, yeah, I want to say this will be our eighth year. Yeah. Somewhere in between seven and eight. And we've got some big stuff planned for you coming up pretty yeah, quick. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I don't think I can really say it just yet, but Yeah, I was about to say I don't yeah. think I don't know that we can but But there are things yeah. people the will know. Yeah, they'll know. If they pay attention. They'll know. So there's another thing I wanted to ask you about. Uh last year, or was it the year before, we sh you shot the Netflix special, How to Be a Cowboy. Yes. Um Based on what you do every day as far as media creation, what was the difference with that like? Um, so there were more cameras. There was more of a production crew. There was more planning. You know, as a YouTuber, we uh, will go out and we'll, we'll think about, like, for instance, we're going to buck some bulls today and we will um, go gather this pen of cows. Well, something interesting might happen, like something super interesting that creates a great title and thumbnail for that YouTube video that makes it go viral. Or maybe it doesn't, and we have to scrap half of it, then do something else the next day. You see what I'm saying? Sure. To make that video worthwhile. Right. So that people aren't just seeing the exact same thing over and over. Practice pen buck out gather a few cows with Dale doing an intro and an outro. Like it's gotta be more than that. Right. Um, was it tougher to navigate that? So with Netflix, it's a 20 person production crew. Half of them are from California. There's, and since it was during the one nine, they each had their own hotel room. Wow. So 20 people, 20 hotel rooms, all that camera equipment, most of it rented, very expensive cameras. If they come out there, we can't just hope something interesting happens. Right. You see what I mean? They're going to be there for two months. we got to film six episodes, and we're going to film a lot of stuff that never sees the final edit, but we don't have time for something to just not happen. Right. So there was a lot more 
planning. Like they they were authentic moments. You know, you can't fake Donnie's buck offs. You can't fake what happened with Carl Wayne. You can't fake us going to these rodeos with Donnie getting on and Jordan going to her deal. Like those are real scenarios. You can plan some things that help tell the story and guide you along what we're doing at the ranch. But we didn't mind doing that just because, I mean, you know, we're essentially just trying to communicate with the audience. You know, it's not a documentary. It's an unscripted series. So, um, but a lot of people ask, like, for instance, the uh, frostbite, the the bull that we named frostbite that gets out at the sale barn, 100% authentic. I would not turn a bull out at a sale barn next to a highway. Um, so that's that's the thing about the show. Like, those cameras, we're running through the parking lot. That's just, that's real stuff. Now, the interview after, where there's lights, and I'm sitting there, and there's a microphone on me, yes, we set that up so that I could explain what happened. But So anyhow, that was probably the big difference. Um, this recent, we went to, did a YouTube video, our last one that just came out on Tuesday, and we found this big old rattlesnake, five foot, like right where this bull just hangs out all the time. So wow. we've got to, you know move, remove this varmin from the, you know, facilities. So anyhow, that, that came up like what we didn't know that was going to happen, but we had to be out there with the camera on and then it did. And now, and now it's the thumbnail and it's interesting and people want to watch it. So, um, that's kind of what we found with YouTube. Like Keith Mundy with American hats told me it's like pouring water on a table and then you just see where it goes and you follow it and that's when you start to clean it up but you got to you, you know you just you got to start pouring yeah and so that's what we do we just start and go and we brought in um a hobbit from montana who's pretty interesting <laughs> as far as like his um ideas and creativity and so he's he's helped us with some with some new twists, like for instance, the rodeo show. Have love you seen it. that? Yes, you have? I love it, it's so funny. Um, so I, I hate to pat him on the back too hard because it'll knock him over, but he uh, <laughs> that was his baby. And so he's done a good job with that. But um, so being innovative in that sense, like new kind of content, fresh ideas, like that's just the nature of longevity for us if we want to still be in business in 10 years, right. which we do. Right. So, Lord willing, we'll be able to still be entertaining. Yeah. Well, speaking of entertaining, one of my favorite things that you do is generally you always bless us with, or you're on your own podcast, you bless everybody with a really funny Dale Brisby story. And I was just wondering, within the last couple months, anything happened that just was hilarious? Anything that happened that just struck gold, that was just crazy out at Radiator? <sighs> We've had a couple of crazy things happen, like the rattlesnake. Um, How did you even find the rattlesnake? You're just walking by the pen, and wow. So when you're when we're setting up a drive on a in a pasture, the guy um, setting it up will drop people off along a you know a backside of a pasture, and then you you gather it all in a line. And so I dropped off Jordan, and Donnie and I were still right there. So there's three of us. And as I leave Jordan, we hear the rattle. And we're all like, we all knew exactly what it was the moment we heard it. So we just turned and she had her camera out before I could, I mean, I didn't even have to tell her. She was <laughs> like, yep. And uh, yeah. So that was kind of cool. Um, Donnie got knocked out. That was pretty, that was pretty <laughs> wild. Um, and then he kind of forgot everything for like a minute or two. It's like in UFC, like, where am I? Yeah. Did I lose? Did I win? I, I was about to get on a horse. He had been on like eight times. I was like, what do I give this horse for rain? He was like, I don't know. <laughs> Donnie, you get on him all the time. <laughs> then uh, Cole had a a saddle kind of slip on him, so he fell off, and then the saddle went under the horse, which if it, you know, this young colt, any horse would do it, but this colt just took off. We had to go catch it in the pasture. That was pretty wild. No cameras. Um. But yeah, that's, I mean, there's been some wild stuff happen, but um, what else has happened? 
We got three new interns. <laughs> They're all looking we thick in real We got three new interns in, in one day. That was pretty fun. Wow, that's wild. So, Has it ever, that's never happened before, right? Dollar. Oh, yeah. Dollar got bit by a rattlesnake twice on the face. So wow. He almost kicked the bucket. It's been a wild summer over at Radiator Ranch. There's a lot of rattlesnakes at Radiator Ranch. Yeah, hopefully we've eradicated some. Of, we didn't find the one that got Dollar, actually. Really? But... um I remember one one of your really popular videos a couple of years back was just you and a couple of guys yeah, going same out. Same pasture, six really? of them. Wow, six of them. Wow. Yeah, there was people kind of fighting me in the comments, and I got a relative that died from rattlesnake bite, and then obviously the horses, and uh, I was like, I was kind of not arguing with her, but I was like, I, I just I think if you had a relative die from a rattlesnake bite, you would feel different. Right. And she said, I would not. And I said, well, we're going to disagree we'll never on know. <laughs> If you put animals, especially rattlesnakes, right up there next to humans, we're going to disagree on a lot. Yeah. I said, because in my opinion, kill them all and let God sort them out. Makes sense. She didn't like that. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't like that. I think the only time I ever got close to a rattlesnake, I was running and I had like these Beats by Dre canceling headphones on, but I got next to this bush. I just finished. I was kind of slowing down. I was breathing, but I heard a shh. Yeah, I was like, that sounds like the biggest grasshopper I've ever seen. I'm going to go look at this bush and see if it's there. I'm looking around the bush. I'm like, I guess I don't see anything. I ran on. It didn't dawn on me until five minutes later. I was like, that was probably a rattlesnake. And it oh, was probably yeah. right by my feet. Definitely. And I'm wearing shorts and Nikes. <laughs> like, and you're lucky it rattled. Yeah. Because sometimes they don't. Here lately, they've not been. Isn't that a, like a defense tactic that they're not rattling to alert you that they're there? So they, won't. So they usually do rattle right. to alert you that they're there so that you'll leave out. But a, some people say that, like, they've been – so as the hogs have moved in – That's what I was hearing, yeah. They uh, – it's because those hogs are so tough. Yeah. Like, if you don't – you can hear the bullet hit a hog and it just won't even knock them down because their skin and everything, the fat, if you don't hit them in the right spot. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine, like, if a rattlesnake doesn't get a good enough bite right where he needs to, even if he does get a good enough bite, like – he's going to be dead before he sees the pig die. Right. So I just, I, I want to believe that, but um, that makes them real dangerous because they're a little, they're more aggressive than like a copperhead. Yeah. Copperhead's not going to rattle either, obviously, but they're not as aggressive. Right. Rattlesnake is a little more come at you yeah. if you get in their bubble. Unfortunately, sometimes their bubbles overlapped with our bubbles. Like right. that relative I told you, he got bit on his front porch. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Went outside uh -huh. to get take the trash out or something. It's like, all right, you're in my bubble. You're going to die, and I'm not going to feel bad about it. Ruthless. But, it's um, just a danger rope. That's all they are. Like, they're just, they're so, it's just crazy to think that something like that has the some power to kill Some people will grab them, will get them live, and have you seen that? Where they'll oh, yeah. pick them up live and snap them like a whip. Yeah, Bear Grylls neck. does that. No, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Not with that guy. That is not on my bucket list. Not with a pit viper. No way. Yeah, I'll do the I'll do the noodling, but I'm not gonna pop one like a whip. Those are cool videos of seeing you out there noodling too. It's so fun. Is it? It's so fun. Do they actually like scratch you up pretty good when you get? Your oh hand man, in? they got little teeth. Yeah, pad. Yeah. Then they grab you and they roll. That's what scratches you so bad. Wow. Have you ever been thinned by one? While you're no, running? I think the one, I think those are channel cats. Probably I are, got finned by that. Them. The fins are are pretty bad. Yeah. Which these are normally like flatheads and blues which the blues have a really aggressive bite, but the mm. channel cats are the ones that will really stab you with their fins. I got finned when I was fishing with my dad back when I was probably like seven or eight years old, and I thought a hook went through my hand. Yep. It was insane. Yeah, that'd I be a channel know. cat. I had no idea that a fish could I'm like, like an old pro. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, let's go catfishing real quick. What? How many times have we been, Donnie? Four or three? Three times. Three times? Yeah. Is Donnie pretty good at it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. once you once you figure it out, it's not – I mean, you just – Lay your hand there? And wait Pretty for much, the, I guess, it's not so black and white. You can be good at it and not good at it. I have a hard time getting my big paws through their gills sometimes or mm -hmm. behind their gills, so I'll lose one or two here and there. But like Hannah, the girl that takes us, like she don't lose them. Like if she can get her mitts on these rascals, she's pulled out a seventy pound catfish before. That's insane. She weighs like one ten. <laughs> 
Yeah. Like eighty percent of her body weight was this catfish on her arm. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, she's doing some uh, some other hunting stuff with one of our other people, Christy Lee Cook. Now, yeah, I've suggested um, Hannah as a rock and roll endorsee for a while. Mm-hmm. We got her hooked up with K and M, another sponsor of mine. But anyway, she's a winner. Yeah. So it doesn't help. It doesn't hurt that she's also pretty. Right. But um, she's she's one of those people. Kind of like we were talking about, like if the cameras die, same thing with her. Like she's going to be shooting squirrels and <laughs> catching like bow fishing. Like she films like 3% of her life and is like goes viral. Whereas, you know, most people in her shoes are like they're going out to do the thing so they can, which that's what she gets. She gets so many people that she's got to like take noodling because they want the picture for the gram kind of deal. Yeah. But I don't know those that 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 kind of situation. A person is only going to win for so long. Mm-hmm. So okay, there's nothing wrong with it morally. I'm not throwing rocks at them, but I think there is a difference in the authenticity. Yeah. So yeah, it's and it's it's one of those things. Authenticity. It's one of those things that you have to strive to go for. But it's it's sometimes kind of hard to be authentic. And, and there's so many people in my in rodeo that should have YouTube channels. Mm-hmm that could have hundreds of thousands of subscribers if they would just turn the camera on because they are so interesting and they do live interesting lives and they are genuinely passionate about it. So it would be an authentic video that would also be interesting. Right. Because it's not just the authenticity that sells. It's got to be something people want to watch. I mean, if you put a GoPro in a truck with Casey Fields and Tilden Hooper, like it would... Everybody would watch it. Right. Just live stream y'all's conversations. That'd be hilarious. But there's so many guys like that going down the road that but um for some reason rodeo cowboys like all they all we want to do is post our runs and our rides. Right. And it's usually a friend out in the crowd with a grainy iPhone that shot you from a hundred feet away. Exactly. Yeah. Which is good, but to me that should be that's bare minimum. Right. We wanna see we should see stuff on the road. Yeah. Buy yourself a zoom lens. Give your friend a zoom lens. Show them how to use it. Yeah. Or just use the iPhone. Just turn it on. Right. But anyway, I understand sometimes it's hard. Well, what you got coming up in the future, man? What's new with DB? <clears throat> man, we've got National FFA Convention, sure. which rock and roll will be there. Absolutely. Um, and then NFR. I'm already like getting ready. Got my Airbnb booked. I've got tags on my trailer so i'm doing pretty good last year we went the registration on my trailer was out by like seven years oh wow so we in the biz call that outlaw trucking sure so which the registration thing isn't so bad because that little number in the corner of your license plate is real small in texas but the problem is we pull into vegas with no trailer lights Uh, that's a little more obvious. Right. So you get pulled over for no trailer lights, then you get the fat ticket for no registration. Back in Vegas. That's real outlaw trucking. Sure. (laughs) But the the cops in Vegas were just so, like, taken aback. They were just like, this is so crazy illegal. We're just going to let you go. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's just like, because they're kind of looking for drug addicts and people, like, doing some real illegal stuff. And so... Bare minimum, all we got is no trailer lights and yeah. registration. They, they don't want to park us on the side of the interstate in right. Vegas. You know, that's way more unsafe. Mm-hmm. So it was crazy. It was just like, you know what? Y'all just keep driving. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's as soon as it was can. wild. It was like, <laughs> but definitely throw on your cowboy hat. Yeah. If you get pulled over, they're, they're just they're going to think you're an old John Wayne. Yeah. Give them the... Oh, sorry, this trailer's been in the barn. I just I thought the lights worked. Never saw it. So that's hilarious, man. Well, I really appreciate you, Dale, for coming in and hanging out with us today. Um, do you have any pieces of advice for all of our content creators out there trying to um, make it as big as you? Well, I was thinking yesterday, I remembered some advice. I, I put it on a t shirt once. It was like a um and but I was in an old folks home and a lady named Beryl. Nice. Which I thought was a cool name. Very. Um, we were playing cards. It was me and I was there to see this neighbor of mine named Jane and Beryl. And one of them made fun of, said something about the other one having bad breath. And she, as quick as one said the 
that line, she responded back, it's better no breath, b- bad breath than no breath. Wow. Which I thought was pretty funny, like especially being in an old folks home. Right. And anyway, um, I put it on a, I, I did a, a Altoids can lid, but it nice. said Rodeo Time Mints. Nice. Bad breath is better than no breath. Um, it didn't sell well at all. But, I'd buy one. That's hilarious. But it, I, it was fitting for me. It was a right. shirt for me. Right. But I was thinking of that yesterday because sometimes after my protein shake and vitamins, mm. like my breath is like really bad. Oh, yeah. We are in a tight pickup, and I was like, sorry, guys, about my breath. But bad breath is better than no breath. So. That's just one you can keep in your pocket all the time, you know? I like that one. It's not that like revolutionary. Yeah. But I guess me having heard it from Barrel. Sure. In in the retirement home, like just it meant a lot to me at the time and coming from her and so yeah. But I guess how it translates to somebody making content is like it's all about perspective. Mm-hmm. You know. It, this is the the US of A. They gave you the internet. I'm sure you have a smartphone. Like you have all the tools you need. And there's a lot of people around the world that have way less resources that are doing more than you with those resources. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know how that correlates to bad breath is better than no breath, but no, it works. Get you some perspective yeah. on life. Yeah, I mean it's the same with me. My whole thing is I always just say just keep shooting. Yeah. Just keep shooting. Yep. You're bound to get better. Even if you think you're aren't, you will get better. Just keep shooting. Just keep shooting. Right, Donnie? Yep. <laughs> Well, thanks, Dale. I really appreciate you coming out and hanging out with yes, me sir. today. Yes, sir. You too, We're going to get on out of here, and we'll see you down the You know road. what? I'm glad Tough didn't come. <laughs> this is way more interesting. Yeah, man. You always have such great stories. And yeah, great Tough talker. Cooper. He'll be here. Three dumb yeah, world champion. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> wear a wavy banner buckle all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just See, I got this small buckle because I'm humble. I don't even have a belt on. I guess you got me there. <laughs> on to the next one, old son. Appreciate it, Dale.